Over the years, video games have gotten a lot more complex, a lot more expensive, a lot more demanding. In their infancy, games stuck to much more simplistic graphics and mechanics. This was not a choice purposely made by the developers, but instead a limitation posed by early technology and the lack of a foundation to build upon. As time went on though, technology increased at an exponential rate and video game concepts began to greatly build on the ideas that had come before them. By the late 90s, gone were the simple mazes of Pac-Man and the straightforward shooting of Space Invaders, replaced with sprawling adventures like Final Fantasy VII and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Video games were slowly becoming a media juggernaut that began to even rival the film industry. AAA publishers and developers were in a race to make the largest and most complex experiences. However, one studio decided to break what had become the modern trend and create a game that embraced the much more simplistic approach found in the earliest incarnation of video games. That game was Super Monkey Ball. We can't talk about Super Monkey Ball without first taking a look at its creator, Toshihiro Nagashi. These days you are probably much more familiar with him because of his Ryu Gagotoku series, or Yakuza as it's known in the West, which has garnered much praise and achieved commercial success in its many releases over the years. But his story begins many decades before the Yakuza series. The year is 1989. A young Nagashi just graduated college with a degree in movie production. Excited to start his career in the film industry, he eagerly sets out to find work in the trade he has spent years studying. Things did not go well, however, as the movie business was in a slump at the time, and everywhere he applied, he was rejected. On a whim, he interviewed at Sega, and was surprisingly hired on the spot. At first, the job did not feel like a good fit, and he began to feel frustrated. Though the gradual move to 3D game development had begun, and Nagoshi's experience with film production ended up being a huge help. He was able to give feedback on how to correctly position and move the camera as well as utilize lighting while working in the 3D spaces newer games were beginning to use. His first major role was as a designer for Virtual Racing, working under the incredibly talented Yu Suzuki. He moved up the ladder pretty fast and shortly after Virtual Racing, he was given the keys to the car for Sega's next big arcade hit, Daytona USA, as designer, producer, and director. Over the next few years, Nagashi continued to bolster his portfolio of games and cemented himself as one of Sega's most important and reliable employees. In 2000, Sega's internal development departments were broken up into many different subsidiaries and given the freedom to function much more independently. Nagashi was granted his own development studio during the split, which went on to become Amusement Vision, Super Monkey Ball's developer. As Sega began to run into financial issues with their Dreamcast console failing to find a foothold in the video game market, Sega's new CEO approached Nagashi, asking why game development had become so expensive and why the company was spending so much on each project. Nagashi responded that games were becoming bigger and requiring larger budgets and that they could not do things any cheaper. But the question began to eat away at him, so much so that he started to become upset over it. Eventually, after much thinking, he decided that he wanted to try and make a new game that used minimal resources, time, and budget to prove that it could actually be done. A game that would be played simply by using a joystick and would not require any lengthy instructions to operate. That game would end up becoming Super Monkey Ball. Toshihiro Nagashi and the developers at Amusement Vision had a good idea of what type of game they wanted to make. Now it was time to actually create it. The earliest idea of their new game utilized a plain ball that was used to navigate through different levels, similar to the classic game Marble Madness. While the main concept itself seemed fun, the team felt that the ball's plain design was too inorganic and unappealing. It was also difficult to get a sense of direction while controlling the ball. They decided to try and put a character in the ball, and this seemed to help remedy some of these issues. They eventually ended up using some cute looking monkey characters that had been previously created by an artist at the studio, and everyone agreed, this was the right direction to go. The team had all the pieces they needed finally in place, and development really started to move along. In 2001, the brand new Monkey Ball Arcade Cabinet was first revealed at the Amusement Operators Union trade show, running on Sega's Naomi Arcade hardware. That's right, Super Monkey Ball began its life as an arcade game, sans the super in its title. 
The machine sported a very unique banana-shaped joystick that really made it stand out and had only one button. One has to wonder if the arcade cabinet never made it over to North America due to what a couple of kids in a Sharpie marker could make the banana joystick resemble. Mm. Monkey Ball hit Japanese arcades in June of 2001 with three playable characters to select from, Ai Ai, Mimi, and Baby. Unlike most games, in Monkey Ball, you take control of the stage itself, tilting it using only the joystick to move the ball around and reach the goal within the time limit. Falling off the edge of the stage will cause you to lose a life and restart the floor from the beginning. There are bananas scattered through each level, which can be collected to boost your score and earn extra lives. Upon starting the game up, three difficulty levels are available, each with their own unique set of floors. In probably the most appropriate product placement marketing deal of all time, the Dole Food Company logo appears on almost every banana in the game, even all the collectible ones. Dole, the largest fruit and vegetable producer in the world, had a licensing agreement with Sega that seemingly expired after the first two Super Monkey Ball games. As Monkey Ball was rolling its way into arcades, development on a console port was already well underway. In early 2001, Sega shocked the world when it announced it would be ceasing all support for its Dreamcast console and developing games as a third-party publisher. Shortly after this, Nagashi visited Nintendo and got some early information about their upcoming GameCube console that was planned to release later that year. He told them that he wanted to make a game for it, but didn't think he'd be able to have anything ready in time for the console's launch. Suddenly, a light bulb went off in his head, and Monkey Ball came to mind. The game's simplistic design might allow it to be ported over in a relatively short amount of time. He might actually be able to make this work. A development team of roughly 10 people got straight to work on the project, and within a matter of weeks, they already had a working port of the arcade game up and running on the GameCube hardware. The team was happy with how smooth and quickly production was coming along, and surprisingly felt even more comfortable developing on the GameCube than their parent company's own Sega Dreamcast. While porting the original arcade game proved to be a relatively simple process for the team, they wanted to do more than just the bare minimum and decided to add some additional modes. Over the next six months, the team worked hard to include extra content for the main game and six additional game modes that were split into two different types, party games and mini games. Many of these were designed to utilize the GameCube's four controller ports and allow friends to play together. Included in the party game section are three game modes, Monkey Race, a Mario Kart-like racing game where players could compete by finishing a set number of laps while utilizing items to affect themselves and their opponents, Monkey Fight, a mode that attaches a large boxing glove to each monkey's ball and lets them duke it out to see who can score the most points by knocking other players off the edge of each stage, and Monkey Target, a very unique game where you roll your ball off a large ramp and into the air, trying to land yourself on various floating platforms that are divided into different point values. While in the air, you can pop open your monkey's ball, which allows you to glide and better maneuver yourself over the landing areas. Falling under the minigames section are three pretty straightforward sports-themed game modes. Monkey Billiards, a mode where up to two people can compete on a pool table in a game of nine ball. Monkey Bowling, I mean it's, well, it's, it's bowling, though there is an interesting challenge mode that lets you bowl with many different pin arrangements. And finally, Monkey Golf, a mode that lets you compete on up to 18 different mini golf holes with either stroke play or match play scoring rules. It's a bit strange and nonsensical watching the monkeys take out a golf club while inside their ball to hit themselves across the course, but in a way, it also adds to the charm. Seeing as how many of these modes were playable with up to four different people on the GameCube, a new character needed to be added to the original cast of three monkeys. Enter Gon Gon, a gruff gorilla that fits in surprisingly well with the rest of the characters and has gone on, no pun intended, to be included in all of the later games. As development was nearing completion, Super Monkey Ball's debut was garnering a lot of interest and hype. It was one of the most unique looking titles that would be ready for the GameCube's launch day. It would also be Sega's first ever published title on a Nintendo home console. <laughs> It was a moment people had never expected to arrive after the two companies' bitter rivalry over the last decade. This was a sight to behold and an incredibly important milestone in gaming history. Super Monkey Ball launched on the GameCube in September of 2001 in Japan alongside only two other titles. 
It featured a unique intro song titled A.A. Poo that would be removed from all versions of the game outside of Japan. The track even later received its own CD release featuring TV star Yu Abiru on vocals. Personally, I like the new track that replaced it a bit more, but that also may be in part to pure nostalgia. While the game received favorable reviews, it had a tough time finding a foothold sales-wise in its native country. Many blamed the GameCube's slow sales in Japan as the main reason for this, but either way, this was not a great way to start things off. Two months later, Super Monkey Ball launched in North America to much stronger sales and even continued to be a top seller for Sega into the following year. With the game finding much greater success outside of Japan, a sequel was inevitably released in mid-2002. Super Monkey Ball 2's North American version was released first this time in late August, with its Japanese version following three months later in November. The game sold and reviewed well, and it became apparent Sega had a new successful franchise on its hands. Super Monkey Ball 2, however, would be the final game in the series developed under Amusement Vision, as the studio would be dissolved in 2004, and combined with Jet Set Radio developers Smilebit to form Sega's new entertainment software R&D department. A few years later, the studio would become Sega CS1 R&D, with its focus being on development of the Yakuza series. Amusement Vision went away in name only, as Nagashi and many other members of the team kept working on and overseeing the next few entries in the Monkey Ball series, including Super Monkey Ball Deluxe, a compilation of the first two games released on the PS2 and Xbox, Banana Blitz on the Wii, and Touch and Roll for the DS. The Super Monkey Ball series would continue on throughout the years, with subsequent titles released after the initial two games having a much more divisive reception among both fans and critics. I.I. and the rest of the Monkey Ball cast, however, would become a mainstay in Sega's legacy and receive cameos in many of their later titles, including Sonic Riders, Sonic and Sega All-Star Racing, Sega Heroes, and even Nagashi's own Judgment. Super Monkey Ball took a chance at trying a much simpler approach to gaming during a time when most other publishers and developers would have scoffed at the idea, and showed that a AAA game that embraced the concepts introduced during the early days of video games could be just as successful as many of the larger, more complex titles on the market. For this, Super Monkey Ball, Toshihiro Nagashi, and the team at Amusement Vision will always have a special place in gaming history. Hello! Thanks for watching. This is my first time doing one of these, so I hope you enjoyed it. And please leave me any feedback, uh, either good or bad, so I can improve and hopefully do some more of these in the future. I also want to tell you two quick little Super Monkey Ball stories about me. Uh, I was in a video game store in the early 2000s, and I was talking to this girl that I thought was cute, and I kind of wanted to ask her out. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw this little guy behind the counter, and I thought to myself, I can either go buy this amazing II uh, Super Monkey Ball plush, or I can ask out this girl. And obviously, you know which choice I, did, I went with. And I walked out of the store completely embarrassed and uh, did not ask her out. And my friend made fun of me probably for the next five years after that. So, funny story. Uh, I also wanted to get the Super Monkey Ball soundtrack. So I ordered this CD, which you saw in the video for about $40 imported from Japan and as you know it has uh, not <laughs> well it has a couple of the songs over it but a bunch of talking and then it has this the single from the Japanese version of the game which I didn't even have so fun times uh, the internet in early 2000s was a very different place uh, so hope you enjoyed the video thanks again for watching and I'll see you soon bye